And I don't need to surrender to my flesh, but I need to surrender to God. Amen. And I need to make him number one. I need to let him take control of the steering wheel of my life. Amen. And I just need to be obedient to him. Now, when you do that, you put somebody else calling the shots. I'm going to let God's voice speak to me. I'm going to surrender to him, and I'm going to follow him. I'm going to, I'm going to follow the instruction of his word. I'm going to follow the instruction that the Holy Spirit speaks into my spirit. I'm going to follow his peace. And when something, you know, gnaws at my peace, I'm going to shy away and, and, and you know, look that over before I jump in. Because that may not be where God wants me to be. And what I'm talking about is you've got to tell yourself no if you're going to surrender to God. There's a reason that Jesus said something that's not preached very popular today. But he said, if any man will come after me, the first thing he's got to do, church, is deny himself. Uh, you, you, when you come after him and when you make him your choice, you're going to have to learn to begin to be involved in something that is self-denial. Y'all with me? Amen. Oh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Is Luke in y'all's Bible? There's, there's one of the four Gospels, and it's Luke. I've been studying a little bit. I've got to take a test Thursday. Y'all pray for me. To pass a written test. It's multiple choice. <laughs> but I took a little sample. I didn't do too spiffy. I was feeling good for you taking that. Well, this ain't nothing. You ever, you ever been there? Yes. Boy, look at here. And I flunked. <laughs> it's an hour. But y'all pray for me. I got to come out the other side with no if. <laughs> What's your spiritual report card say? And I know it's not about our performance. You know, I'm not saved, but where are we at spiritually? We're living in the last days. There's no doubt about it. We are in the last days. There's, there, there's enough craziness going on for whatever. And I, and I don't see it getting any better. But I tell you what I see. God's people better draw near to him. God's people better draw near to him. He promised in the book of James, if you draw near to God, draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. And, and if you want that, if you want that closeness, if you want, you know, I want to surrender, I want to be close, so you, 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 you got to move in God's direction. It's not going to fall on you. It's not going to be something that you just open up one morning. But I'm telling you right now, he said, draw near, draw nigh, and he'll do the same. I, I really sense in this year to come, before I ever looked at that number thing, I, I, I thought, well, you know, this, what, what, what am I sensing? What am I, what, what am I to share that would be of spiritual importance? And I really feel like this would be a year to uh, return. A year to uh, find your faith. You know what I mean? You, don't, you ever lost something? Can I, can I share a little experience with you? This was, this was recent. We're doing good on time. I was, I, I was uh, shooting, y'all know I love to shoot pistols. And I got these nice sights put on there, Ooh. and I'm out there shooting. And uh, what you do, you, you got to really focus on your front sight. Now, you know there's a reason when you miss? Your sights wasn't lined up when you pull trigger. I promise you this, if they are lined up, and you pull trigger and nothing moves, you're gonna hit what you're aiming at. Yeah. I shot off a couple. And you know, there's a little recoil there, but you, you gotta keep your eye, get back on it. And I went to get back on it and there wasn't nothing there. My front sight fell off. <laughs> and I'm not picking on women, but this lady, I let this lady put these sights on. And my gut said, don't do it, don't let her. <laughs> Was that 
Who's that the Holy Ghost real? I don't know. But I, I've got uh, three or four sets of these same sacks, and they, none of them fell off before. But, and I wasn't picking on her because she's one of it, but just like, you messing up, boy. Well, lo and behold, I lost it. I lost it. And I got down, crawling, digging, looking. I, I thought I got me a Madden. I mean, I, I put forth some effort. I'm still right back to square one. I lost it. And what I'm talking about is I once had it. Y'all with me? I once had it in my possession. And I could use it. And I could lean on it. And I could trust it. And I could, you know, all these other things. It was, it was nice. It was important. It was a blessing. However you want to label it. But now it's not there. Are y'all with me? It's not there. Isn't there a portion of scripture way back when this axe head fell off? Oh, alas, it was borrowed. I ain't even thought about that. I ain't even read that. But the bottom line is, we was doing something with something that didn't belong to us. You know, uh, every good and perfect gift cometh from God from above, church. Uh, and if there's something good about you this morning, you got to give glory unto Amen. God. And if there's something about you that's better than it was yesterday, you got to give glory unto God. And if you accomplish something on your own, it's really not really worth having. It's really not worth investing in man. But, uh, what I'm talking about is the things of man. But whenever God begins to do things in your life, that is a good thing that you can have, Amen. that you can lean on, that you can trust, that you can rest in, and that's what He wants to do for you. God wants to bless you this morning. But you've got to walk in faith. Huh? We've got to walk in faith, church. There's a parable I'm going to share with you found in Luke 18. I'm, I'm, I'm really pulled toward prayer. And, and I'm, 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 I'm really thinking that I may be here for a while in this prayer thing. But the church has got to start praying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody that I'm not praying. Here's what I'm saying. The church has got to start praying. Yeah. The Christian community, the, the body of Christ has got to start praying. If you say you have faith and you don't have a prayer life, there's something unhealthy. I'm preaching to myself this morning. I'm right here with you. I may have to say on me to myself a few times this morning, but I'm going to preach the truth. Because the fact of the matter is, there's power in prayer. And when the church quits calling upon God, when the church quits praying and, and, and calling upon His name and trusting Him and believing Him, we're in trouble. I said, we're in trouble. There's a lot of things, a lot of organizations that gather. You could gather daily, you could gather weekly, whatever the case may be. They don't have to have anything in the world to do with God. But there's, there's something there that you get this group together, you know. But I'm going to tell you something, church. We are the church. We're not just a group of people. We're not just a, a happy-go-lucky kind of thing. We come together in the name of the Lord. We come together because we have like precious faith. Not because I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Catholic. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about I'm a Christian. And it's good when Christians come together in the name of Jesus Christ. Because he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Uh, and there's something that the church needs today. It needs some signs that are following them. Uh, we need to be laying hands on the sick so that they can recover. We need to be casting out devils in the name of Jesus. We need to be preaching the good news of Jesus Christ so that somebody that's strung out on drugs and alcohol and all type of addiction can come up out of that better than they were before. Amen. Because that's the God we serve. He said, I come to set the captive free. He wants his people free. But we got to have faith and we got to be praying. 
And until, I mean, how can Christians not see the significance of a prayer life? Huh? Well, I'm a police officer. And you don't see the significance of a, uni a uniform and, and, and the, the gear that goes with it? Now, I'm a, I'm a carpenter. And you don't see the significance of a good level? No. There's something wrong. Huh? You, we're not going to hire you to protect this town. We're not going to hire you to build this house. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you specialize in, if you say, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, you can put this on anything. And when they say the most key useful tool of that occupation, ah, that's opinion. That's opinion. Huh? I'm free. I'm free, free, free. I've heard about all the free I want to hear. I'm going to tell you what we need to hear. It's time to get on the horns of the altar, church. It's time to draw near to God. It's, it's time to put our faith in Jesus Christ and, and for the church to begin to pray. I said it not long ago. I love you, church, but we got, we got to have a breakthrough because we're headed for a breakdown. Hmm. I said we got to have a breakthrough because we're headed for a breakdown. Amen. You got some rods knocking. Oh, I rebuked that rod knocking devil. Well, you just keep right on driving because you got some slop in there. That's going, it's going to take some work to get that out. It's going to take some attention to get that out. And that's not going to just disappear. And we got to start by getting back in prayer and faith. You know why people don't pray? Because they don't have faith. I'm not a rock scientist, but there's some things I do know. Now, I'm not going to try to get up here and tell you my opinion on things I don't know anything about. But I'm talking about some stuff I know about this morning. And when people are full of faith, they pray. They're moved. You see, you see circumstances and they speak to you. And you're either moved by fear because of the circumstance or you're moved by defeat because of the circumstance or it just leaves you crippled. It just leaves you helpless. Or you see this circumstance and you know, you know, you know, my Redeemer liveth. Huh? My Redeemer liveth. You, we need to go through some terminology stuff a little bit. Redeemer is the fact that he bought me back. This no longer has an effect. This no longer has control. This no longer has power. And when that circumstance comes at you, when that picture of the enemy's been painting and waving before you, that don't belong to me. That don't touch me. Now, who do you think you are? I'm redeemed. Uh, and my redeemer liveth. Uh, and as a result, uh, that's not going, that, that, that giant is not going to defeat me, but he's already been defeated, and I'm not going to let that thing conquer me and live, let that have dominion over me. You got to have faith. And the reason people aren't praying is because they, something's happened. I said something's happened. If, if, there, if there was a machine at Walmart and said insert this dollar bill and out will come 20. I think, and they said this is only going to be open during church hours this morning. They're for sale, Leon. You know? They're for sale. Because they got more trust in that piece of paper. And let's just say we're going to have a special and it'll be over Monday morning. Okay. There'll be some fights at that machine. There'll be, you break in line. Uh, they're going to round up as many dollar bills as they can. And I promise you, you, you break in line, somebody will smack you in the back of the head. 
they're co conquering. They'll take your dollar bills because they want them toys. Huh? Y'all with me? They ain't even been up there yet. They just heard. But they believed. And they put their faith in that. I got something better than that. And I'm not talking about the world, but I'm talking about the church. You know, we were, we were in uh, Jeremiah this morning, and, and, and God said to him, What have I done that would cause you to lose trust in me and turn to these gods that aren't even gods at all? What did I do along the way that has caused you to feel like this? Well, that flesh is powerful, isn't it? I said that flesh is powerful. And that's the bottom line. We might preach this next week. But I can't help myself. Brother Lynn mentioned this morning how Moses, he's going up to get the law. I believe he said something like this. Didn't get halfway up there. They down there having an orgy. Hmm. Where'd they learn that? I don't think they learned it from just leaving and crossing the Red Sea <laughs> to where they was at. They, you know what I mean? They seen some stuff back there in bondage. It stuck. Yeah. And circumstances begin to paint this picture. And it's just so easy to fall back on what you learned in, back in bondage. Oh, yeah, this was how they done it. And it's always sensual. It's always, if it feels good, do it. It's always along the lines of there's not a spiritual bone to be found in it. But it's always about edifying the flesh man. The church, I, want, I just want to share it with you this morning that the key is found in a prayer life. I'm here to tell you, well, I don't have time. Well, here, here's what I'm going to tell you. You better, you better cut something loose because you don't find time to, for anything. You make time. You make time to go to work. You make time to eat. You make time to take a bath. You, you know, what if somebody said, I just don't have time to go to the bathroom. You'll have to excuse the way I smell this morning. I haven't had time to go to the bathroom all week. What would you, you'd say if they'd lost it? I'm just sharing something with you to help you to see. You make time for everything. And it's time for the church to make time for the things of God. Will you be more saved? No, that's not what I'm talking about this morning. But you will be more powerful. You will be more effective. You will be more anointed. Your light will shine brighter in this dark world that we live in so that we can win some to Jesus. Mm-hmm. I said, mm-hmm. Did y'all find Luke 18? We better get to reading I'm going to read eight verses, starting with verse 1 of Luke 18. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regardeth man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, and Jesus said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Y'all believe what I just read to be true? I, I 
mean, that, that's, that, that right there is more true than anything. You know, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, the smartest minds you could put together today and they could say, well, here's what happened. But they weren't there. But who wrote that was there. And he knows what happened. And the, here, this is a good starting point to build your faith. The only absolute truth you got is found in the covers of the anointed word of God. The only absolute truth. Now there can be things taken out of this and repeated and you can say, well that's absolute truth, but it is found in the word of God. And we live in a world today that wants to call uh, good things bad and bad things good. They want to pervert the truth and they want to twist and, and, and they want to get, get people to accept things that, as if it was God's will or if it was God's plan. But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible still says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's some things in here he's not changed his mind about. Uh, if he came to take away the sin of the world and if he hung upon Calvary's cross and he gave his life's blood for every single sin past, present, and future, sin is still sin. Uh, it wasn't, if it was a sin a hundred years ago, it's still a sin today. Uh, and we don't need to complicate this. We don't need to confuse people. God loves sinners very much. Uh, God loves every one of us very much. Uh, and you take somebody who's, who's uh, into the worst stuff they can get their hands on, God loves them very much, but he does not love sin. He abhors sin. He hates sin. As a matter of fact, he sent his son to die for sin because he hates it so much. And he wants to redeem humanity. And, and you never are going to gain ground or be spiritually affected by telling somebody that, oh, that's okay. God will overlook that. We have to bring it all to the foot of the cross. We have to, every one of us at some point in our life, we have to come and we have to surrender to Him and we have to put faith in Him and we have to pray. Amen. So I got saved and I didn't pray. Huh? Come again? I got saved and I didn't pray. Impossible. Here's what the Bible says. Well, no, no, I went through this program and they told me when I do this and do that and I, I never prayed one time and I'm saved. You can believe the lie and be named. Here's what the Bible says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you didn't call upon his name, you're not saved this morning. It doesn't matter who raised you. It doesn't matter what house you've been in. It doesn't matter what church you grew up in. There comes a time in your life when you've got to fall under Holy Ghost conviction and you've got to see that the things going on in your life are just uh, hideous. They're black. They're unrighteous. Uh, and they are sin. Uh, and you've got to realize that He died for this. He died in my place. And if I call upon his name, and if I put my trust in him, he forgives me. He redeems me. Amen. That's how you get saved. Can I go a little deeper? Yeah. I might be on thin ice here, but that might be how you stay saved. Mm. I, I, I'm just saying, it might be how you stay married. Keep talking to your spouse. It might be how you keep your job. Talk, talk nice to your boss, man. Huh? He does write your check, don't he? You know? If you go in to work tomorrow, you say, I, just, I can't stand you. I just look slap your face. But I'm going to keep working here because I. Hmm. How's that working for you? It starts off, it says Jesus spoke a parable to them. Men, to this end. What do you mean to this end? Along these lines. Here's the, here's the uh, gist of the meaning of this parable. Parables were real things in life that help you see, help you understand. And it says he spoke a parable to, to them 
And here was the gist of it. Here was the meaning of it. That men ought to always pray and not faint. Y'all were fainting. I guess I, I, I fell out. I passed out before I fell out for you, you know. But I mean, just actually fainting. I don't know. But I've seen people faint. I remember seeing people stand in line so long. It was hot and I was there. Boom! One of them hit the ground. I thought, oh, I was getting religious in and saying, oh, Jesus, don't let me fall out. But, you know, they fall out and they drag them over under the shade tree. Brother Leon, I'm thinking, I hope I'm not next. But when, when they fight, they check out. They were here. They were kind of in tune, you know. They were part of what was going on and bloop, lights out. Not part of it. You checked out. You mean, was they really there at one time? Absolutely. He used the word faint. He said, men ought to pray all the time and not faint. Here's the truth about this. When you quit praying, get ready for it. Boop. Let me say that again. You can get ready for that. How you enter in? By prayer. How you going to not faint? What do you mean? How you not going to check out? How you not going to lose heart? You got to continue to pray. You got to continue to pray. If you've been married for 30, 40 years, you said, yeah, I told her I loved her the day we got married. I ain't said it since. You probably don't have a spicy little atmosphere. Are y'all with me? People like to hear. You know, I got I got a little grandson. He, he started to come alive. He's about seven months old now. I tell him all the time, I love you, buddy. I love you, buddy. I said, Olivia, you think, you think he knows what I'm saying? She said, I don't know. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. There's going to come a time in the clear. Yeah. Huh? I want him to know. Amen. I want him to know. And I'm going to tell you something. We, we got to spend time communicating with our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. That's biblical prayer. You pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And we need to be loving on Him. We need to be worshiping Him. We need to be giving Him glory. We need to be thanking Him. And, and you know, there's also, we bring our needs and our requests and all this other. But here's the bottom line. Whenever we just faint, whenever we just check out, uh, if you don't come out of that, it's not good. When people do faint, what's the first thing they start trying to do? Get them to come to? Hey, get, bring them around. Don't let them stay like that. That, that can do damage. That can do permanent harm. Uh, and that's not what we need. We don't need spiritual damage. We don't need spiritual harm. We need to come back around. We need to come out of this little fainting spell. And we need to get back in prayer. That's what Jesus was saying. That's what Jesus was trying to get across. There is a connection between praying and then when we don't pray, spiritual fainting. Verse 2 said, There was in the city a judge who feared not God, neither man. What you're talking about here is this wasn't a spiritual judge. You don't have to be spiritual in this country to hold public office. That's not a shocker, is it? You can be the devil himself and hold a spirit, I mean, hold a public office. You can be in politics and you can be just as evil as the day is long. There's nothing new under the sun. But Jesus was saying this. This judge here that I'm going to use in this parable, he had no concern for God. He had no love for God. He had no concern for people. He had no love for people. How come? Because he was all about himself. Uh, I look around the world today and I see a common denominator in a lot of situations. Uh, people seem to be all about themselves. Uh, people seem to be at the end of the day, their only concern is me, myself, and I. And I'm going to tell you, that's what's hurt 
even the church today that, that we're so self-centered, we're so self-focused, getting back to what Jesus said, the first thing you got to do is tell yourself no. And that is the opposite of being self-centered. But this judge here, he was not a Christian. He was not a believer. He was not a follower of Christ. He was one that really could care less about God. He could care less about people. He was all about himself. Are y'all with me so far? Amen. Not the best judge. I, you know what? When you go to a judge, I like to see a judge full of compassion. Amen. You're going to before the judge tomorrow, Leon. Do you want somebody that's all about themselves? Somebody all about themselves might take a little palm greasing. Hey, Leon's coming tomorrow, and we, we, we need him locked up. Here's about four of these Benjamin Franklins. He locked up. Present your case, Brother Leon, and it wouldn't matter what you see. That's the kind of person he is. You think it don't happen? It happens. He's wanting you to see something here. In the worst of people, there's a, there's a scenario about to unwind here. And this woman's going to get her way with this no good judge. Now we don't have a no good judge up in the heavens. We have a good judge. Are y'all with me? He loves you this morning. He loves people. He's concerned about people. And he wants, he's, he's got your best interest at heart, not like this. But even this bad example come through. This, this should help us have more faith and a father to call upon him. There's a widow in that city. Widow, what do you think of? Well, a lot most time older. Uh, you know, there's some widows very wealthy, some are not. Some don't have a big family to do for them. You know, some it could be a bad way. Wasn't no, wasn't no social security check back then. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You, you depended on just whatever. What what the governmental system in place that provided for you. And in, in other words, she had nobody to lean on to get help. And she basically comes with this cry. Avenge me of my adversary. What are you talking about? She had someone who had wronged her. She had someone that she was labeling as, you're my enemy. We have an enemy, church. Whether we like to admit that or not, you have an enemy of your soul. It is Satan himself. And he has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if I could set you all down and, and, and talk with you one at a time today, I promise you we could work up a list where if we got honest, we could say the enemy of our soul has wronged us. He has stolen from us. He has killed what we had. He has destroyed what we had. And we would like to be what? Avenged. Y'all remember that old Pentecostal hymn? Uh, well, we, we don't forgot the words to it, but I'm going to remind you a little bit. I'm going to the enemy's camp, uh, and I'm going to take back what he stole from me. You know, that ought to excite us a little bit. That ought to encourage us a little bit because there's times we look, well, that was a total loss. So, boy, he's done kicked in the front door and just took away my stuff. Uh, but when we begin to see things like that and we begin to see that the God we serve is a God that answers prayer, it ought to begin to move and stir us on the inside that I'm getting back what the devil stole from me. This is not permanent. She comes to this no good judge and she didn't look at her situation as permanent. She said, avenge me. In other words, I'm looking for you to make things right. He flaked her off. She probably had no money to give you. Y'all think that matters? Oh, I'm, I'm trying. But next time you go see your good little lawyer friend, tell him you ain't got no money. Was that wrong? Uh, you know, I've had people, I'm not a lawyer, okay? <laughs> and I'm not picking on lawyers. But I've had people say, hey, could you, uh, 
I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. I don't have no money. That's all right. But I'm just saying. Seems like when you get in these little higher class professions, they don't do too much stuff for nothing, do they? Hmm. Oh, I wish I had more time. You know, there was a time in this country where you felt called to be a school teacher. You felt called to be a doctor. Huh? Now it's like we put our little brilliant minds up there and they say, what's this pay? What's that pay? I uh, won't that one. Yeah. Don't care about your people getting healthy. Don't care about your people getting well. But if I can, if I can just get 50 of them through here a day and, and you know, do a little report on them, uh, send a little medication with them, uh, I'll make X amount of dollars. Uh, and they could care less about your health or your well-being. And, 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 and they sure was not called by the Heavenly Father to do these things. I'm just getting real. Maybe that's why the church is empty. Am I too real? Who you want cutting your stomach open? Somebody looking for a paycheck or somebody said, I feel like God's called me to help folks through modern medicine. <laughs> I'll take him. <laughs> we'll pass on you, buddy. Are y'all with me? She said to Benjamin, he wouldn't fool with her. You ever been told no? Did you let that stop you? I'm just saying. Depends what it is. You know, you, I could say, first time I asked to live out, she slapped me. I don't want Mike to look like an abusive person. But, you know, that was hard to get over for you. You hurt my pride and all that stuff. I come back, I said, I'm trying again. I had on a football helmet this time. <laughs> but just because you get told no, don't stop. And, and, and even more so when you know what the Word says. If He said, I come and set the captive free, and I'm looking for freedom, and that's, that's the direction I'm going in, and, and the answer is no, don't you stop. I said, don't you stop. If he said, I come to give you peace that'll pass all understanding, and you get up and you're like, I'm, I got the farthest thing from peace. I don't even have a word for what I got this morning. You need to, don't take that for an answer. And you begin to seek God to fill you with peace. If he said he'd give you joy unspeakable and 